And so, for those of you who have not been here, um, I, about three months ago, maybe, September, October, um, I'm like, oh, sweet, four Sundays to Christmas, um, I'm not going to preach all of them. So, I shot a text to Brett, Sean, and Lee, and I said, um, you guys pick your favorite part of Christmas and um, see what God gives you and preach on it. So, I'm always of the mindset that I am not the uh, reigning authority of this podium and what needs to be said and what needs to be heard. Um, I am one piece of the puzzle. And so, um, yeah, this week is Lee. So, the floor is yours, sir. Sweet. Lee the Magnificent. <laughs> you know God's going to move when you have your own little tear puddle in the back of the room and it hasn't even started yet. Um, so, Merry Christmas, everybody. So good to see you. Thank you for, um, ex- I know some extra people came out here, Michael, Joel, and his family. Um, it's, so, it's so good to see you guys, and I'm so excited uh, for this Sunday specifically. Um, I, it may be hard to believe, but I knew God was going to give me a story for for today before I knew today was going to be a thing and before I knew what the story was going to be. Um, it was probably six months ago, God gave me one little sentence and it, was, and it kind of stuck with me and it would start to make more sense as the time would go on and it was just <clears throat> look up and take it one step at a time. Um, and I know it sounds... It sounds kind of cliche and it sounds like way too easy to be true, but one of the things I wanted to, uh, I want to share a little bit with how God made sense of that and hopefully some of you can find some hope in it. Um, And this isn't a message for those who have it all together and it certainly isn't a message for those who find it easy to just keep humming along and throwing out prayers and all the prayers, uh, all the prayers are answered just as they would like. It's a message for those who, like me, have poured everything, everything they could muster, leaning on God, (laughs) um, only to seemingly fall like deeper into despair of not being answered. Um, (laughs) It's a message for those who have a hard time just grasping to that hope and just hoping and clinging on to things that are going to get better um, or really understanding how something good could come out of the pain, the loss, the seemingly lack of a path in the way. Um, so if, you, if this doesn't apply to you and if you're one of those people who everything's just super easy, I mean, Coffee Beast is right over there, Ultimate Rio is delicious, <laughs> but um, I think I really wanted to, when I was asking God, what do you want me to speak to on Christmas? And I think there's a really big part of the story that we don't, we don't talk about and we don't really admit to it uh, that I kind of want to speak to. Because it's funny how different people respond to this season, just the words Merry Christmas, the fact that it's Merry Christmas and not Happy Holidays. I think in some people there's just a nostalgic power behind those words of your picture in, you know, presents and Christmas trees and peppermint mochas and all the things that just kind of come in the season when you're... Um, it's just a time of kind of celebration. And then you have other people who they get frustrated and they get angry at the seemingly erosion of the true meaning of Christmas. And Jesus is the reason for the season and we have to celebrate Jesus as the gift uh, in this moment. But I think this time of year specifically, it can, be, it can be really lonely and it can be really hard for people who don't seem to find that reason to celebrate uh, in everything that's going on. So today, if it's okay with you, uh, I'd like to like, try something a little different and kind of draw a little, uh, some attention to, I think, part of this story that uh, we kind of miss. Um, so I'll go ahead and start this weirdest Christmas message ever by pointing you to this term, Saturday. <laughs> like, uh, and I'm sure it doesn't make any sense uh, yet, but hopefully over the course of this morning, um, maybe some of you can relate to it a little more. So. Um, so it's updating. So, who here loves Saturdays, just in general? 
Like, <laughs> you get to sleep in, you get to go have brunch, maybe you do chores, some grocery shopping, something like that. You can waste away the evening just binge watching Netflix or whatever, and it's like Saturday's this great time where I don't have to worry about anything. Um, so d today, I'd like to kind of shift your way of thinking about it a little bit. Um, we'll start with just, think of Saturday as the space between. Um, the space between. <laughs> so, because um, you think about it, and even, even the, if Christmas was the start of the story, if it was Jesus being born so that he could save us after, even like Breck talked about last week, hundreds of years of seemingly no answer from God, uh, promised the Savior and they had all their expectations as far as what it would be and it was the first moment where it became um, when Jesus became real and even if you think about it um, I guess I didn't throw it up there but I think one verse that kind of always confused me a little bit uh, was especially growing up was John 1 1 in the beginning was the word and the word is with God and the word was God and as a kid I'm like that makes no sense like why would God just this all-powerful God the creator of the universe and he's like a vocabulary term like it just seemed it just didn't seem to make sense uh, until more recently when I was thinking about it as Word, what is a word? It's in your head, you have this thought, you have this concept, and it is the expression of that concept into reality. So if you think of Jesus in that terms, being the word, he is the physical expression of this nebulous entity that is God. And Christmas is the start, um, is the, the action where God became the materialization of his salvation process. Um, and even if you think of it as kind of like the start of the story, so what was the finish of the story? So if you, even if you think about Easter, you know, Jesus crucified, Good Friday, super famous. Uh, three days later, he rises again on Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we celebrate that. But I think it's really interesting that there's this kind of big piece, this day in between the, uh, but that Saturday, if you will, the space between him dying on the cross and him raising again. And if you think about it, between the promise and the blessing, the promise and all the things God said he would do in that end state of when, when it would all make sense. But I know for me personally, I struggle on those Saturdays. <laughs> like that space between, hey, God said he would do this. Hey, I'm expecting this to happen. God loves us, right? We're all praying. Um, and then when you don't see an answer to that prayer, then where and you feel abandoned i think there's a human part of me that really struggles on those saturdays it's that that time where you really feel alone and i know i know has anyone else felt this way before like i know i have um and this is where i think we get it wrong sometimes because we spend so much time talking about the triumph and we spend so much time just celebrating all the things that we can point to this is god moving you can't dispute this but in reality, I think a lot of us, we pull away because we, we pray and there are moments I think where God comes through so clearly and then there's also moments where we find ourselves in this space between on the Saturday where we don't see God, we don't feel God and we have no idea what's going on. And when we don't talk about that and when we don't lean into God and we don't lean into others during this time, we withdraw and people don't hear this side of the story. And when people go through this, then they think they're having a different experience than everyone else. And so that's why I think God really wanted me to share just this, this story, this process of learning when thing, you haven't seen Sunday come yet. Um, yeah. And I, I really do think it's interesting when uh, how the Bible just skips over skips over this uh, between 
and if you go, you know, the gospel, first four books of the New Testament, and you read through the chapters, and it talks about the burial of Jesus, and it talks about Sunday, there's no chapter dealing with the, how the disciples suffered through it. Um, for example, right before it, Luke 23, 53, 54, uh, and they talk about taking Jesus' body off the cross. Slide change error. Cool. Uh. Then he took the body down from the cross and wrapped it in a long sheet of linen cloth and laid it in the new tomb that had been carved out of the rock. This was done late on Friday afternoon, the day of preparation, don't know what's happening, uh, as the Sabbath was about to begin. Did you catch that? The Sabbath. Um, that wasn't an accident, and I think especially with Sean's message, maybe that'll make a little more sense. Uh, we'll kind of speak to you. So, Even if you take it as simplest terms, as the Sabbath is a day of rest and it's a day of worship. It's almost like it's a clue on how God's telling us to get through those seasons. And next time we see it, Mark 16, 10, 14, this is the closest I could find of shining a light on how the disciples were feeling. It said, let's just talk about Mary after she encountered Jesus, after he rose again. And she went to the disciples who were grieving and weeping and told them what had happened. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> told them what had happened, but when she told them that Jesus was alive and she had seen him, they didn't believe her. And think about that. The disciples, the ones who literally walked with Jesus, one, they were grieving and weeping. They felt defeated. They felt this God that they had poured everything into was... It, that maybe they start doubting probably what maybe they had dedicated their life for. They'd lost hope. They found, they found themselves clinging to that hope in that space between the promise and the blessing. And if they did that, oh, sorry. and if they did that, if they were struggling to see God moving despite his promise and despite every effort he had made before they entered that season, saying, I will be with you, and this is kind of what has to happen. In that moment, it was hard to, it was hard to follow. Um, and I hope that you can find some reassurance in that, that even the disciples, the ones who physically walked with Jesus, felt the way we do. And yet we don't talk about it. Um, so maybe it's part of the normal human experience and our inability to actually hold on to it without God there, without Jesus with us in those moments. Did it? Right. So uh, I just want to talk a little bit about my Saturday. Uh, and I really do feel like God gave me this story Gave me and my smoking hot wife Sarah this story to to really help people through this. Um, I know a lot of you know this part of our story because you've helped us through it and you were there praying with us throughout the whole thing. But if you weren't there, uh, catch up a little bit. Uh, me and Sarah, we've been trying to have kids for like five years. Uh, we've done pretty much everything we could to try to figure out what was going on. It just seemed like unexplainable like we couldn't figure out why it wasn't happening yet and it just seemed like every month was just another set of disappointment and I think if you've ever been in a season like that where you're holding so hard to your hope and you're trying to trust God that he's gonna come through and this miracle is gonna be delivered and then every time it doesn't happen it doesn't meet our expectation then there's a part of you that that maybe leans into it a little bit less that maybe if I trust too hard and it doesn't happen, then maybe there's something wrong with me. Either my faith isn't strong enough, or maybe God's not there and I'm making all of this up to make myself feel better. And I think that there's this whole part of self-preservation in our human nature that in those times, it gets really hard to trust to God. And I know he put that desire in our heart uh, for kids. So it just seemed like, how could God be this good father if we're still finding ourselves in this season. Whether, and I'm, regardless of what your season is, if it's 
a marriage that's falling apart despite your best efforts, if it's watching a loved one slip away due to cancer, and it just seems like there's nothing you can do to stop it. Um, I think this is a more normal part of our lives than, than we talk about uh, very often. So, I know for us, uh, we, this, we started like in September, um, going through the process of IVF, and so that we're, I think before I had really been hesitant to do that because I didn't want to, it felt like I was giving up, like I was trying to take it in my own hands, I just wanted to trust, trust God more, pray harder, and then it'll just happen, and we'll have this magical solution, but there was a point where me and Sarah were driving and we were talking about it, and I just felt like this release, like God was saying it wasn't worth, uh, it wasn't worth the continued pain um, of trying to hold back and trying to trust in something else. Maybe that was a part of how God wanted to do it. But there's also a part of me that's like, if I'm investing that much more of my heart into this and it doesn't work, how crushing that would be. And I couldn't even imagine it. Um, so we went through the whole process and we're like, hey, if we're going to do this, we need to keep God in the center. Because <laughs> just out of out of pure desperation. Um, and so if you know anything about the process, there's a ton of shots, it's a very, there's tons of doctor's appointments. And one thing that we did was every time before a shot, we'd throw on the worship song and we'd pray through it. Uh, right before we did the shot, every time before going to the doctor's office, park the car, pray together, and then we'd go in. <clears throat> So anyone who's been through a season like that, it's like, how could, like, there's nothing more we could do. Um, and then it was just this complete roller coaster throughout the entire experience of it seeming like things were going great. I'm shooting out texts. I'm, <laughs> and I thank everybody for the prayers. God's moving. It's a miracle. And then the next day it would be, pray for us. We need help. This isn't looking good. Um, so when we finally got to the point where we did the, the <clears throat> for example, they do, they do a process where essentially they mass produce eggs so that you can try to get as many fertilized eggs as possible and then so that they can transfer them through because the odds is like 50% per embryo they transfer of it actually st sticking and you getting pregnant. Um, so we... They retrieved like 18 eggs, uh, which is crazy because they think they normally expect like 10. Uh, sure. <laughs> Taking your hint. Um, so they normally hope for 10, and we got 18. And I remember, um, I remember just being overjoyed at just how excited that was, and then. They basically they let them develop for essentially like a week before they put them in. And out of the eight, we didn't get a call. We we're expecting to do that day. We ended up getting a call the next day. And they said, sorry, <laughs> um, sorry for like the delay, but we were trying to figure out what was going on. Because out of the 18, I can't even remember the number. There were like two, yeah, there were two that were like mature, where they thought they could fertilize. Um, which is crazy because it's like 90%. Like we should have had a easily 15. And so just thinking that there were two was just crushing. Um, and then the next day we find out, oh, actually we waited and then somehow eight more of them fertilized. And it was like, okay, now we have a ton of them. And then we just went through this whole roller coaster. It seemed like every single day it was changing. And then when we finally got to the day of the embryo transfer and they had two that had survived and neither of them were in that great a condition. They hadn't developed as far as they normally like them to. Um, so I remember just the feeling where we like, this is our only shot. We get one chance at this. Um, that's, that's those moments where you get desperate. <laughs> um, so one thing I did, just cause I felt like there was nothing else I could do. And I think as a husband trying to do something, I made a decision, I'm gonna fast. I've never fasted before. I'm gonna fast until the pregnancy test. So uh, it was like a week. Um, yeah, it was, it was like a week between transfer and when we'd go back in for the blood work and the pregnancy test. I didn't eat anything, praying like crazy. Uh, 
And we, we went in for the blood test and we got home because we have to drive to Lubbock for it. And it was like a four hour excruciating waiting period after the blood test before the phone call to say whether uh, Sarah was pregnant or not. And I remember I went in, I went into one of the rooms in our house, I locked the door because I was about to get vulnerable. I threw on uh, some worship music and I got on my face and just started thanking God for everything that he had done because I think in that moment, all I could think about was my fear of what could happen and how easy that would be to get a bad phone call. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, it started <laughs> snotting all over the place. Um, it started out like just, I'm going to thank you, God, for who you are. I'm going to rest in who I know you to be before I ask for anything. I'm going to thank you until I run out of things to thank you for, which could take a while. And it was like, I'm on my face and I'm like, thank you, God, that there's carpet and that my face isn't in the dirt. And then it was like, thank you for this house because it's really, uh, actually, it was probably hot outside at that time. Um, I remember just going through this whole process and then it was right after we had that, uh, where Rafer flipped the script on the communion as far as it isn't just something you show to God, but you need to, uh, half of that part is that receiving piece and listening to what God has to tell you. And I remember just asking God, like, God, give me a word, help me through this. Um, poor Sarah was like working on the computer at the same time, so I'm like, I'll do this for us. And I couldn't hear anything. Like, it just felt like silent and I was so anxious. I was like, oh, God, I need you like now more than ever. Give me a word of hope. Um, and I was like, on my face, knee, like kneeling, nope, not working. Lay on my back, look at the ceiling, not working. I fell asleep <laughs> at one point, and I remember like, but I felt like God woke me up with a word, and he said, look at what I've done. And I was like, you're right. And I went and I grabbed this whiteboard, and I wrote it down. And I took this whiteboard into, um, I don't know how you, if anyone wants to, whatever. Uh, I took this whiteboard and <laughs> and I started, like Sarah, during this time, to fill that space of all of our worry and all of our anxiety, I'm going to, let's just start writing down every moment along this whole process that we've seen God move. And it was just everything. I even wrote all of our friends praying for us and most of you can see your names on there. Um, and I really wanted to just fill that space before the fear creeps in of who God is and what he's done. Because it's like, I may not be able to see what the outcome will be. I may not be able to see where he is in this moment. But God's way of bringing me comfort in that moment and his solution to this was lean into me and remember who I am. Um, so I was filling this out and I think I got, I got to hear... Uh, <laughs> And while I was here, we got the phone call and Sarah was pregnant. And like the joy, for, you know, I told it forever. <laughs> Thank you, though. Um, <laughs> um, and just the joy in that moment of being like, it worked. God listened. Um, and if I felt almost empowered, like he honored the sacrifice of not eating, because that's super hard, and but just the bringing him into it of all the praying, all the, the, just keeping him kind of the cornerstone of the whole process, and then we find out a couple of weeks later, uh, after we had our first soldier sound, and they didn't, they couldn't see anything, that uh, it was an ectopic pregnancy. So essentially, it was embryo had moved into the tube and it planted in the tube. So you. It can't grow there. Um, it'll try, but it's a risk to Sarah's life because it can tube can rupture and you can die of internal bleeding in like hours, and it's crazy. Um, so the whole conversation shifted at that moment to how do we keep Sarah safe? Uh, <sighs> get through this. <laughs> um, And that just seemed like a really sick joke. Um, it's like, it'd be one thing if God didn't answer the prayer and she wasn't pregnant, but then try that long, invest that much, she gets pregnant. 
and then we have to give her a shot to stop it. So I think that was probably, that was definitely the most crushing experience I've ever felt. Like I literally, the best way I can describe it is like I was gutted. Like, like sword in stomach, everything fell out. There was just a shell of a person. Um, because it wasn't just that it was hard. That whole time, I'm trying to be the good husband. I think it's probably the longest I've sustained and cried. But I'm trying to be a good husband. I'm trying to reassure her, no, this, God showed up. Remember, remember what he's done. Remember, let's focus on who he is, and we will get through this. Uh, and then in that moment, I felt wrong. I felt like I had led her to disappointment. I had led her into pain. And then I started, and that was a struggle for me, because it's like, why invest in something like that? Why lean so hard onto God if it feels like he's just gonna move out of the way and you're gonna fall on your face? And I think regardless of what it is in your life, um, where you felt this way, I think, I, think there's, I think there's a way, at least that I'm starting to learn and how to protect against that. Because even throughout the time I was fasting and just talking to some of you and everyone was so encouraging and praying for us and like you, this will work. We have declared it. God is good. We know he's good. It's going to happen. And then I remember talking to Raver. He's like, remember what was the last thing God said? And I said, to do IVF. And I'm like, but I, he never said it was going to work. Um, so there's that fear. If he didn't say it's going to work, how could I lean on that? How can I expect that? Um, so it's like, how do I lift my expectation, lift what I'm praying for above that? And I remember shifting, trying so hard to shift into God, whether or not this works, I want you to be glorified in this. Like, it has to be above the circumstance. It has to be above what you can't control. Because when we put words in God's mouth and we say, God, prove your God by doing this thing that I want and that doesn't happen, that shakes our faith. And we can't afford that. We have to put it in the constant and of his character and the constant of who, who he is and we know he is unshakably good eternally. And if he is always the same and he's unshakably good eternally, there is no circumstance that should change our praise for him. And that is the last thing you want to do is praise. Um, but it's what we need. So, just working through this process, I remember I tried, there was a moment where I was really struggling and I was just like, God, give me the words to speak to what you want me to get out of this. Because there was a moment we came up here after we got the bad news and we're kneeling and we're praying and I know God, or I know Rafer has said, listen to God's words when you're worshiping and praising him. And there was a moment where I had this realization that There is someone out there who's going to have this happen to them who may not have God to get through it. And my story, having God to get through it, is going to be what helps them. And thinking of how worth it, how worth it that was, because I couldn't imagine trying to go through this without God. Um, and it, it changed it. It changed my perspective. Um, so this is kind of what I wrote. Some of you might have seen me post this on Facebook, but it was, if I let what I can see dictate my praise, ah, uh, dang it. Thank you. I'm getting a slide change error. Let's read it off my paper. Um, if I let what I can see dictate my praise, who do I make my God in the presence of he is, un he is unwaveringly good? My hope, it's by definition meditation on his past, present, and future goodness. So I choose praise in pain, for it's the only thing pulling my heart closer to the one who can get me through it. Break it down a little bit, because this was hours of thinking. So if I let what I can see dictate my praise, if I put, if I let the things around me in this broken world determine my view of who God is, 
that them tell me who when to praise God for who he is, then who am I making my God? In the presence of he who is unwaveringly good, there with me in the moment and forever. And if you think about the word hope, I thought it was cool. Jenny spoke to that too. Just it's the expectation of something good. Or it's the... So a lot of times we hope in the wrong things. We hope in the circumstance. We hope that things are going to turn out the way we want. We hope that that person's not going to die, that it's not going to end in divorce, that we're not going to lose that child. And then when it happens, <laughs> then we get in a pretty bad place. So it's a, it's, I think we have, we're called to shift our focus, that meditation, the I have to fill my brain and repeat over and over until, it, until I believe it who God is, the fact that he was, he is, and he will be perfectly good. And that's where the hope comes from. And that it's impossible to lose hope when we can comprehend who God is. So, and, and Rafer's spoken to it before, but as far as choosing to praising God through the pain, and I think the best way I can describe it, like, You've seen little kids standing next to their parent and somebody walks up, it's like, oh, hi, little kid. And the kid's like, just turns and buries their face in the parent. And I think that's so interesting because that's instinctual at such a young age and we grow out of it. It's like God put in us when you're scared, when you're hurting, you run to your parent and you bury your face in them. So you have to because it's like this wedge. Like, if you feel like, God, you're not deserving of my praise right now. How dare you let this happen? You're farther away. God, I don't feel you. Where were you when I needed? Now you're farther away. And you get to this point where you're separating yourself from the only person who can get you through it. So whether or not it makes sense, you have to. Because he because to not would be to say that he isn't who he says he is, and that he's always deserving of our praise. I think there's there's a story that kind of this over the last couple of months I thought was in the Bible, um, the Joshua, the story of Jericho. So, if just Joshua six one through five. Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go out or in, but the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king and all the, its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, which carrying a, a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times with the priests blowing the horns. When you hear the priests give out one long blast on the ram's horns, have all of the people shout as loud as they can, then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. And I, I think it's interesting with this because in general, what we want, this is our formula. We ask for something, God answers it, we praise him. If he doesn't answer it, we don't praise him. But if you think about how the order of events in Jericho, first thing that happens, God delivers an impossible promise. He says you're going to walk around the town, the walls are going to fall down of this strong city. I'm sure everyone in the military at that time was like, that is the stupidest idea ever. It's like, it's actually embarrassing. We're just going to be walking around looking like we don't know what we're doing. We're lost or something. And, but, it's, but that's where he starts. He starts with, I'm, I've delivered you this blessing, like past tense. Next thing. He, so he gives d the directions that make no sense to us. Because if it's something that makes sense to us, who's going to claim credit for it? We are. And he's greater glorified and the less it makes sense, so he's going to make it absurd. And I think a lot of times even we'll find ourselves in these moments where we're expecting something to happen. And God gives an impossible promise, this person will be saved from this, or this will happen, and then we don't see it, and he just says, keep going, and it just doesn't seem to make any sense to us. But I think the most interesting part was God's battle plan for taking this city was to walk around the city 
and declare his victory as if it's already happened. It was the physical act of praise as they're walking around glorifying God as if he'd already given them the city. And you notice it was, and then shout, and then the walls fall down. It wasn't they'll fall down and then you'll shout because he did it. It's, you're declaring what he's done. You're declaring he's going to get you through it. You're declaring that God is good, that God will fulfill that promise, and that's what activates it. That's what activates the blessing and the fulfillment. Because um, then the prayer is answered. So I know it's kind of a, I know it's kind of a weird way of looking at looking at Christmas, but I think if you think of Christmas as the start of it, so Christmas is the one thing is it's the gift. It's when Jesus came to save us, and it's this time of celebration. But also remember that at that time Christmas was born, how many people knew what was going to happen? Like, how many people recognized the significance of that moment? So I just wanted to use this time to kind of remind everybody that if you, even if you haven't seen the fruit of the blessing that he's promised you, and even if it seems like it's eroding and you're getting farther and farther away from that happening, that somewhere it is happening right now. God's already answered the prayer. He's already fulfilling it in a way that you're not expecting because he loves you that much to carry you through it, to answer that prayer. So, make it practical. I think the two things that I've been learning throughout this whole process is praise through the pain. I don't know what's going on with these slides. I keep getting a slide change error. Um, whatever is praise through the pain because it pulls your heart closer to a place where God can encourage you, where God can give you <laughs> words of where to go next, for, or even just to let you know that he's there so you could feel his presence for a moment to refresh you, to be able to keep going. Um, and to not let the circumstances we're seeing dictate whether or not we praise him. And the second, I don't know what's it. The second is look up and take it one step at a time. Um, this is the soldiers marching around, marching around Jericho. Whether it was, you think of the wise men, like they found Jesus without GPS. <laughs> like, like they just straight up, like, hey, go over there, and they're like, okay, follow in the star, like. Like, God gave them a sign, He gave them a direction, and they took it one step at a time, and you know that didn't make sense a lot of the way. Um, but that's how God calls us to follow Him, one piece at a time, holding to the truth, looking to what He's done and how He's already proven His character, and then just keep listening, keep leaning, keep burying your face, pulling yourself closer and closer to who He is, because that is the only way you're going to get to where He wants you to go. Um, yeah, so I, I want to pray for anyone in here who might be finding themselves at a time or knows someone uh, in a season like that where just they're at a loss. Um, God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are eternally good and nothing can change that. God, I just pray for everyone in this room right now who's going through something or who's been through something without any explanation, God, and is tempted to pull away because they haven't seen what they thought was coming and they haven't seen your hand in it. They haven't felt your presence in it. They haven't heard your voice helping them through whatever it is that they're going through. God, we trust in who you are. We trust that you are good. And God, just help us and give renew our strength, renew our focus, and help us to continually lean into you, to praise through the pain, keep our eyes locked on you, and just take it one step at a time, trusting in who you are. And in those moments, we're having a hard time doing that, God, I just ask that you have the mercy to remind us of what you've done of who you are and your character so that our hope can be anchored in our meditation on your past, present, and future goodness, God. 
We thank you. We love you. And pray all these things in your name. Amen.